everyone. My name is Dreska Nunez Medina. Uh, welcome to our final Bla um, Black History Month program. We made it through and it's just been so exciting to hear all these stories and hear people um, to, you know, share all of these beautiful Tennessee stories. And we're, we have some more to wrap it up. And before we get started though, um, just a quick reminder that our chat box will be on the bottom right hand corner. Just press that button. And if you have any questions, you can send them to me. Make sure it has it's listed to all panelists and you can send us any questions you have um, tech wise, but also if you have any questions for the panelists, we'll have a Q and A at the end. Um, but I'm gonna hand it off to Bridget Jones, our social history curator, and uh, we can get started with this conversation. So take it away. Thank you, Joyska. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Bridget Jones, and I'm the curator of social history for the Tennessee State Museum. And I'm super excited to be here today. If you've been following along, we've had Black History Month programming for the whole month, and we are rounding out that month tonight. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, today we have a few very special guests. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves here in just a moment, but we're going to be focusing on historic Black communities. Uh, this time around, we're going to be looking at origins and possibilities. Now, to go ahead and kick us off, I'm going to ask Mr. Richard Griffin to introduce himself and what community he represents. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Richard Griffin, and I'm located here in Henning, Tennessee, the metropolis of Henning, Tennessee, located exactly 49 miles from the front doors of the Peabody Hotel in Memphis. We're a small community, a small rural community in West Tennessee. Do you want more information? Uh, no, you can give us your position. What do you do for uh, in Henning? I'm the site manager here. In here, this is my seventh year site manager at the Alex Haley Museum, and uh, that uh, I wear many hats in that particular position. All right, thank you so much for that. Next up on my screen, I have Mr. Irvin o Overton. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you do? Right now, I'm a retired gentleman. And uh, I've been retired probably about 17 years. Uh, I was, uh, my last job, I was uh, Chief Operating Officer, Executive Vice President of Erlanger Health System here in Chattanooga, here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I also uh, ran for the mayor of the city of Chattanooga uh, back about 1994. Uh, I'm a healthcare executive. I've been doing that work after I re after I uh, left the school system, I was a, a teacher at Howard High School in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and that's really where I met a gentleman here, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, at, at Howard High School. That's where I met uh, Walter Williams. Um, I um, I have been pretty much an activist all of my life, uh, starting uh, back with the uh, civil rights movements. I was part of the situation of cities down in Louisiana. Graduate of Hillard University, master's degree from the University of Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor. And, uh, I've served as president of several national organizations uh, in the healthcare in the health field. So basically, my work has been in healthcare. Uh, right now, though, I'm an associate pastor of Greater Tucker Missionary Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I, I think that's about it, is it in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And last but certainly not least is Mr. Robert Smith. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? All right, my name is Robert Smith. I'm a graduate of Tennessee State University and Howard University School of Law. I am a member of the firm Smith and Hirsch, and I'm an associate uh, assistant professor at Tennessee State University in the Criminal Justice Department. Uh, the Edge Hill community is where I grew up in Edge Hill projects. And that is the basis, I believe, for which I'm going to speak about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time out of your days to speak with us today. So we're going to go ahead and jump on into the conversation. And I'm going to start with who, again, is first up on my screen. And that's going to be Mr. Richard Griffin, representing Henning, Tennessee. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Henning, Tennessee, for those who do not know? First, I need to let Mr. Overton know that he's in good company because I'm also a former educator of 32 years, and I'm glad to be here as well. Henning, again, is a small rural community in West Tennessee. 
Um, Penny is a very hometown feeling kind of place. If you were to come to Henning, you would feel right at home immediately. As a matter of fact, there's a story where Alex Haley was in a local restaurant here, and when he would come home on many occasions, he would go to the local restaurant, and he was so friendly uh, that people would, would meet him in the restaurant and, and go over, sit and eat with him, and it was as if they had known each other forever. Henning is still very much that kind of place. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was giving a, a tour uh, just a day or so ago, and uh, some folks drove down the, uh, as a matter of fact, it was a virtual tour for a school in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, someone drove down the road as I was outside, uh, giving them a tour of the outside of, of the house. And one of the students said, uh, why did that woman speak? Why did she say hi to him? And why did he say hello back? And we had to explain to that student that we are here in the deep south and it's customary people will wave and people will speak and uh, people will speak back to them. So Henning is very much that kind of that kind of place uh, back in 1919, 1920 when Alex Haley lived here and also today. Oh, that's amazing. I'm familiar with the area. Uh, my family was enslaved in Grand Junction, Tennessee, which isn't too far from Henning. My mm -hmm. grandmother was born and raised there before migrating to Memphis. So there's definitely that small town community feel in West Tennessee that I definitely relate to and love just so, so very much. Um, <laughs> now, next up on my list is definitely going to be Mr. Irvin Overton again. Now, Mr. Overton, can you tell us a little bit about the history of Chattanooga, specifically the Martin Luther King area? Okay. I the, think uh, that's called the, the Old Nine or something like that. Yeah, Big Nine. Uh, the Big Nine, nine. okay. <laughs> but let me get the two Big Nine first, okay? Uh, Chattanooga is a city basically surrounded by mountains and ridges. It's in a valley. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the Tennessee River uh, runs right through our downtown section and goes on down to join Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and okay? uh, Tennessee was a has always Chattanooga has always been kind of like a industrial town. Uh, it was a railroad center many years. Uh, when the train, when the passenger trains and the freight trains and all the major highways poured into into Chattanooga on their way north or south, okay, Chattanooga was kind of like a place where uh, the, maybe the first train stop after you left Atlanta on your way to the north, okay, whether you were going to the northeast or whether you were going to the to the northwest, you stopped here in Chattanooga to probably change trains. Then you moved on up to wherever you were going as a destination. The river, though, uh, as I said, flows through Chattanooga, and the river has been probably a main feature of this community since it, since its since its beginning. Uh, Chattanooga was founded right at the downtown section of downtown section of Chattanooga in a, a place called Ross's Landing. A gentleman by the name of Don Ross uh, had a landing there that created, and that's where a lot of the trade, the fur trade used to come into there, and I guess whatever crops and things that might have been moving north, east, south, and west. So Chattanooga has always been kind of like a central. Keep in mind, it, it, it was a it was a kind of like a nectar, uh, north, east, south, and west. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. It had, a, it had an Indian population here, lived on the north side of the primarily. And then there was an African American population uh, that lived initially on the north side of Chattanooga, all near the downtown area, but certainly on the side of the river. Uh, both of those populations uh, uh, were somewhat disseminated. Indians uh, were moved on out to the uh, Great Relocation Program that happened early on in history. Uh, the African American kind of kept continuing to grow, and it eventually came across the river. Uh, and started locating in what is called the downtown area. Uh, downtown Chattanooga, for many years, basically a, for residential purposes, basically a black area, okay? Uh, raised the question about Big Nine. Big Nine was known, it was two sections of it, the West Ninth Street and the East Ninth Street. Uh, it, was a, it was a street that was similar to maybe Auburn Avenue, maybe East Hill Street uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Memphis. But it was kind of like the hub where black businesses are located. 
and mm -hmm. it ran for it ran for 30 40 blocks okay uh east and east and west it had mm -hmm. a great economic center there along that street you know the barber shops the clothing stores owned by black folk black, black watch repair shops uh you know they even had a five and dime store that was operated by an african American family, uh, a lot of restaurants and a lot of nightclubs. Now, you know, one, two of the most famous people from, from the real long past was probably African American was Bessie Smith. Okay, Bessie Smith grew up on the west side of town, right off of Big Nine Ninth Street. Okay, and so that's why we ended up here in Chattanooga having a Bessie Smith uh, Museum, a okay? cultural center. Okay. Uh, but I think you raised some questions with us earlier about well, what was along. I think you wanted to know why was entertainment so kind of prevalent in the Chattanooga area. Here again, it related to the train routes, the highway routes, everything kind of poured into here. There was this commercial center in downtown Chattanooga that was black owned and operated. Okay. Uh, it might have been like Tulsa, Oklahoma, okay, mm -hmm. back in the day. But eventually they decided to do away with that. So what they did was they started uh, urban renewal uh, in the early 50s. Urban renewal wiped out pr pretty much the whole west side of town. Okay, uh, put a major highway through there, uh, and so blacks were blacks were relocated uh, out further into the Chattanooga community. Okay, but the entertainers used to come here to basically play music. Okay, they would stop here on their way somewhere else. Nightclubs got a lot of free entertainment out of, out of them. Okay, uh, one of our more famous uh, personalities right now is a great actor Samuel L. Jackson. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, raised right here, was raised up in one of the oldest black churches probably in America. Okay, uh, he was from Chattanooga, so a lot of these musicians were just coming through. They weren't necessarily staying. Okay. Um, so that's kind of like Chattanooga in a nutshell. You know, it was a, it never was a cotton town. Okay. It never was a cotton town. Okay. It was a, it was a town that, that exchanged goods. Okay. It, it was too hilly and rocky. There were no plantations in Chattanooga. Plantations were located down in Georgia and down in Alabama. Okay. You have large plantations here in the Chattanooga area. As you move west towards Memphis, Nashville, you had find some plantations. Over, over that way. So that's kind of like uh, it was a great industrial town. You probably heard of the Chattanooga Choo Choo. The Chattanooga Choo Choo was an actual was a general locomotive that was located here after the Civil War. Okay, and that that train stayed here for years, and they finally moved it to a little town down in in Georgia. Okay, so that's kind of like it. Uh, great town, uh, great people. Uh, Two indigenous had an indigenous population of Indians, had a, had a slave population of African Americans, a bunch of white folk uh, who were raised all around us. That's it. Best I can do. <laughs> no, thank you for that. And um, and what you said about Chattanooga not being a cotton town definitely historically made it extremely unique uh, as a southern city in in that time period. And I think it still contributes to a lot of its uniqueness today. Um, so thank you. Now, Mr. Smith. Could you tell us a little bit about Edge Hill? That's a community that's definitely historic to Middle Tennessee, specific to Nashville. Can you give us a little bit about the history of Edge Hill? Yes, Edge Hill is one of the first post-emancipation African-American neighborhoods. Uh, when it was initially founded, it was referred to as New Bethel or New Bethany. And it came about because of uh, what had happened during the building of Fort Negley, which is a Civil War fort that is one of the uh, landmarks in Nashville. They had rounded up all of the African Americans. They had either rounded them up as slaves and even free persons. There's one story that the Union Cavalry surrounded uh, three of the African American churches and rounded up those people and brought them in, as well as getting African Americans from the plantations. And they built Fort Negley and Fort Morton. And that is in uh, the Edge Hill area. And that was the introduction of. Uh, uh, in that regard uh, to that community. Additionally, in rounding up the various African-Americans to help build those forts during the Civil War, Nashville was one of the first uh, Southern states capitals to fall. So Nashville fell early in the Civil War. 
whenever uh, and what the African Americans would do, they would, uh, since we were considered contraband, and contraband is anything that a citizen is forbidden to have by government. Uh, therefore, once the city was conquered, a lot of the African Americans fled to the Union camps and the Union uh, uh, troops. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Civil War, the Union Army had captured, obviously, the state capital, and it was therefore called, it was turned into a fort. It was Fort Andrew Johnson. All of the African Americans then gathered around and camped out near the state capital, which had been turned into a fort uh, for protection and also for the, a sense of freedom now that the Union had conquered Nashville. That is significant because that would be the African American community all the way up through the 50s until it was destroyed uh, during urban renewal in the 1950s, which many of those people moved to the Edge Hill community. The Edge Hill community was also made up of the uh, black citizens who had been enslaved at the uh, Traveler's Rest, which is over on 8th Avenue, uh, mm -hmm. Belmont, uh, which is now Belmont University. Belmont was one of the largest and leading plantations uh, in Nashville. The Bay Plantation, the uh, John Compton Plantation, which is in Green Hills, and any other of those plantations. Now, many of them, again, were rounded up over 2,000 to help build those forts and also defensive works uh, in defense of Nashville during the Civil War against the intrusions of the Confederates who continued to try to protect Nashville. Mm -hmm. But that's essentially in Edge Hill, since everybody had moved. Uh, into the Edge Hill area, it developed as a bustling business area among African Americans, had groceries, stores, businesses, drugstores, restaurants, other commercial enterprises. The, uh, we also had a university, we had Robert Roger Williams University, which was down the street of Edge Hill. Uh, it was a theological seminary as well as a normal school, which is a school that teaches, uh, trains teachers. Uh, ultimately, uh, because of bullets that continue to fly through the schools, two strange um, fires, because the area began to white citizens, of, began, white citizens and affluent white citizens began to move in that area. And uh, it was a message for Roger Williams College to leave. Roger Williams leave that site is now occupied. They sold that site to Peabody College and then they moved uh, uh, the school, uh, and then ultimately it was located, uh, 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 well, in essence, they had to sell the school ultimately, and they sold it to Lemoyne Owen College uh, in terms of they moved the school to Lemoyne Owen College. Mm -hmm. But uh, Edge Hill was a cross-section of uh, diversity in terms of it had uh, middle-class Black citizens, mm -hmm. and it had poor citizens. It was anchored around the Edge Hill projects where most of, uh, a lot of us did live. And of course, uh, many of them attended the various schools that are located in the community. And then Cameron, which is about uh, two miles away, is a high school that, uh, that everyone had to attend and walk to. But that gives just a little bit of an idea about the edge of community as far as African Americans are concerned. I appreciate that. When uh, I originally heard of Edge Hill, it was definitely during my time at Bell Mead reading through the book that Dr. Lovett wrote yeah. on uh, African Americans in Nashville and he That's speaks right. about uh, Edge, the Edge Hill community at mm -hmm. one point in time kind of rivaling the Jefferson Street community concerning uh, the population of African Americans and the prominence of the African Americans in the community uh, most yeah. notably being Preston Taylor and mm -hmm. his uh, with Greenwood Cemetery and Park so uh, mm -hmm. thank you for that I think most people definitely overlook Edge Hill when they think black history in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to pivot a little bit now, uh, because I think culture and spirit is something that's relative to Black people, to the Black experience. Uh, culture and spirit is something that we have down-packed, but it doesn't matter where you go, that culture and that spirit is going to be a little bit different based upon uh, the environment, the traditions, and the region in which you're living. So I'm going to start again with Mr. Griffin. Could you give me a little bit about the culture and the spirit of the community that is Henning, Tennessee? Um, again, being located near Memphis, um, when the Palmers lived here at the boyhood home of Alex Haley, and Alex Haley lived here with his grandparents, Will and Cynthia Palmer, 
Um, there were only 495 folks here in the town of Henning. Henning was predominantly African American. Uh, today, there are about 1,002 folks here in the town of Henning. And excuse me, formerly was predominantly white. Today, there are 1,002 folks here, and in, in Henning is predominantly African American. Uh, my father grew up out in the country near Henning, and my grandmother and my father told me many stories of the kinds of things that went on here. As I said earlier, Henning is, is very much a family oriented kind of place. And what, what am I saying when I say that? Well, Henning was a small rural town, uh, of course, Lardale County, uh, Halls, Gates, um, Ripley and Henning are the four towns in Lardale County. It's known for its agriculture. So here in this particular county, uh, there was a, a lot of cotton being raised, okay? There were the tomatoes being raised, soybean. My grandmother tells me they even raised sugar cane here. So you see farming was the way of life here, uh, 50 miles northeast of Memphis out here in Lauderdale County. So the gins were, 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 were everything here. My grandmother tells me that uh, once a gin showed up, and by the way, Henning had three gins, once a gin showed up, they needed supplies, so a store would pop up. And because there was a store that was supplying the gin, people would move to that area because they also could use the store. And the next thing you would know is that uh, a school would, would, would surface because the students needed a place to go to school. Here in Hitting, uh, the first school uh, was called Palmer Turner, named after Alice's grandmother and one of the first teachers there. And then, of course, your churches came. Uh, New Hope CME Church, St. Mark Church, right here in town. And people were able to worship, they were able to shop, and they were able to work. So the culture of this area was, was, was one of folks that lived in the rural areas, lived out in the country, and mostly sharecropped and worked in the far, on, in far, on farming, in farming. Mm -hmm. Now, on a Saturday night, there was no work to be done. You couldn't go into Ripley. Mm -hmm. you couldn't go into Ripley. My father says because you just didn't go into Ripley. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the younger uh, white teenagers had cars and they would gather around the square in Ripley. And uh, my father said, allowed to be there. So mm -hmm. where did they go? They came to downtown Henning, Tennessee. And there's a street here called McFarland. And there was a, a place where you could hang out. Now, my father uh, was born in 22. Alex Haley was born in 21. And when I spoke to my father after Alex had written the book, he said, you know, I probably saw him down there on a Saturday night. He said, but of course, he didn't go by Alex Haley. Maybe he went by Butch or something. He said, but I'm sure he was there because everyone in the area, whether you lived in town or you lived out in the country, you came to town on a Saturday night. And what was it for? It was for fellowship. It was to meet and greet. Uh, and that's where the fellows met some of their wives downtown <laughs> Henning. Uh, there was great food to eat. There was dancing and just a good time to be had by all. That kind, that is the culture of Henning, Tennessee. And it's still very much that way uh, when we get together in the town of Henning. Uh, family, family reunions, church gatherings, church picnics, annual church picnics and homecomings and things of that nature. I agree. Thank you so much. I could be a little bit biased, but you know, it's something about the community of West Tennessee that is so uh, welcoming at all times. So I've definitely experienced some of those uh, those Saturdays where people are just outside and enjoying one another's company. Uh, that spirit and that culture is still alive and thriving today. Um, now, I can assume that this is probably true for all of our communities. Mr. Overton, would you like to jump in on that about Chattanooga? What is a the culture, what is the spirit of Chattanooga? And also we have a comment. If you could try to turn your microphone up, um, some people are saying they cannot hear. If you cannot, I totally understand. I'll make a difference at it. Is that any better? For me, it's, for me, it's good. As far as I can go. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I, I was just listening to uh, Mr. Griffin's uh, uh, description of his community, and uh, Chattanooga, Chattanooga is, is kind of a, 
usual town. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it was a segregated community to the core. Okay, um, you know we we always had a separate school system. We had a separate uh, transportation system. Uh, we had a, a taxi operation that was called a Jitney Line, and uh, it ran from one side of town, and it was owned and operated by black folk. Uh, we had a huge, uh, not a, but I guess for me as a child, we had a huge public park here that was owned and operated by black folk. Okay, okay. and in that, and in that pub, it was called Lincoln Park. Okay, and in that public park, uh, they, the people owned, the, they owned the rides. Okay, you had a large Ferris wheel. Okay. Had the fine Jenny, and had the horses, that had bumper cars. We had all of those things, but they were all in Lincoln Park. Okay, and people used to come from Atlanta, Nashville, New York, Birmingham, uh, Knoxville. They would come to Chattanooga over the weekend. Okay, and they would stay here, and they would stay in the few hotels that were here. Well, most times it was a drive up in the morning and a drive back home. At, at night type operation. Mm -hmm. but Lincoln Park was an unusual feature in the South, okay? Uh, a black, a black operated park, okay? And, uh, and, and so I, growing up as a child, I saw that Chattanooga was also a kind of like a minor league baseball town. Uh, had several baseball teams that played here. Matter of fact, I saw, I saw Hank Aaron play here. I saw Willie Mays play here. I saw Jackie Robinson play here. Of course, a lot of that I was looking for a knot hole in the wall. Okay, mm. knot hole is a hole in the fence that has been punched out. Okay, so we had to go and peep in. But there came a time when they would let us sit in the black section of baseball park. Okay, so everything was was really segregated, uh, but but not to the point that you were just totally excluded from it. Okay, of course we were excluded from church operations. Okay, mm -hmm. and all of that. The black church grew up fairly strong here, had some fairly large black churches uh, over, over the years, and we still have that. So spiritual, the spiritual side of the black community is fairly strong. But that entertainment side of Chattanooga was always there. And the big thing is, is that, you know, you had a black baseball team, and then we got a black, got a black golf course, you know, uh, and all of those things. Uh, see, now some of these things were participated in by the city, Chattanooga, but they were always, some of it was always operated separately and distinct from white facilities, okay? So segregation during my lifetime uh, was really a, a, a big problem. Highly segregated city, was always a city that tried to have its own uh, type of entertainment, always tried to have its own type of social life, et cetera, okay? Uh, the fraternities and sororities, uh, uh, you know, People left Chattanooga and went away to schools, and they came back and they formed uh, graduate and alumni chapters of the fraternities. That became a social life type thing here in 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 this community, and and a lot of the achievements of our young African Americans uh, post my year, post my years and now even today, they're re, they're the beneficiaries. Okay, these African Americans who came back home uh, to get jobs, then to start working to promote social and cultural development in the African-American population. And, uh, I take my hat off to them every day because that Divine Nine has done a magnificent job here in Chattanooga trying to motivate and develop our younger, our younger population. So in spite of all of that, you know, in spite of the segregation, in spite of the discrimination, I'll give you an example. I was about six or seven years old, I went across this uh, large railroad yard, highway that was over it. There was a white park on the other side of this, uh, other side of this railroad yard. It had a sign, just as you started to go down the hill, that said, uh, no dogs or the N-word allowed in this park. Now, I saw that, okay? I also saw buses pass through our neighborhood bringing kids to white schools uh, while we were walking in the snow and the rain and all of that. They on the bus riding okay, to their school. So it was a highly segregated town. Politically, politically, because blacks lived in certain geographical areas, while they couldn't produce a mayor, they couldn't produce a, a city county councilman, 
they could influence those those elected officials operations so a strong black community, political community grew up in that really delivered to white candidates okay couldn't get enough votes to do it on your own and finally we broke through we broke through on that uh that now we had a separate uh you know the schools were segregated okay and uh, had two governments okay and you had the public school system you had a county school system all of that was uh all that was segregated uh the county council had no african americans on it the city council had no african americans on it so i guess in my generation those of us who came back we decided that we needed to make a change in that history we started pushing african american candidates to start getting them that led to the restructuring of the city government itself okay etc now one thing i didn't tell you uh i think this is important chattanooga was a highly polluted town okay uh, you couldn't even see on some day came through here uh, because of the smoke. It was an industrial town. They made they made pipes here. They made uh, they probably made some of that cotton gin equipment here. I, I imagine. Okay, fire hydrants. You know, they made sinks. Uh, you go in your bathroom now and you see names of certain companies on certain pictures. All that stuff was made here in Chattanooga. Okay, and then put on the railroads and then put on trucks and bust out. But it was industrial setting people in chattanooga could work if they wanted to work but they were going to be working in no professional positions unless they were teaching school okay um and and here again that's 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 just the way that was okay uh when i came back to chattanooga i got i was the first african american to become hired by a hospital in a management position and um i can tell you that led to some more getting hired okay but I think that that was just no people that are high professional. Town was sick. Town was financially, I guess, segregated. You had the rich people who lived on the mountaintop. You had the middle class people, I guess, who lived in, in kind of like what suburbia neighborhood, a little further out in the city. You had the African American population who lived in the inner core of the city. Okay, that produced some interesting dynamic politics. Okay, so. That's kind of like it. The culture here was always, as you stated earlier, always highly centered around a lot of entertainment, a lot of clubs, a lot of churches, you know, et cetera. There's a church on every corner in Chattanooga, not two. That's it. I can't give you much more than that. <laughs> no, thank you so much. There's so much that I agree with. I've been taking notes that you're talking. Uh, but one of the first things that you said that stuck out to me is the importance of the Divine Nine. Uh, for our listeners who don't know what the Divine Nine is, it is the uh, nine Black Greek-lettered organizations that you can uh, gain admission to in college throughout your undergraduate years. Um, so they will be Alpha Kappa Alpha, Delta Sigma Theta, Zeta Phi Beta, Sigma Gamma Rho, Omega Psi Phi, woo, Phi Beta Sigma. It's a few Kappa. there. Uh, <laughs> Kappa Alpha Psi Alpha Phi Alpha and uh, Iota Phi Theta. So there's my spit for the day. Uh, but the Divine Nine definitely has played a big role in the the, the the constant progression of Black Americans since their creation. I mean, I think that for most people who aren't aware of the Divine Nine, uh, you may, because I know for many white fraternities and sororities, you pledge and you pledge for college. In a Black organization, you pledge for a lifetime. And I think that lifetime bond was always very evident in Black communities because you can see that continuation. You can see that that purposefulness and that 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 strength that's rooted in the, the history of these organizations. So it's always good to see how they've impacted Black communities throughout time. So I appreciate you making that comment. Um, now, from you, Mr. Smith, could you tell us a little bit about the culture and the spirit of the community of Edge Hill? Because again, many people don't really know about Edge Hill's black history. Yes, Edge Hill, uh, I think the best way to describe it, it was by churches. It had churches on each side of Edge Hill. And Edge Hill was, uh, and it also had something that was interesting as a community in two respects. One, you had uh, middle class and upper class African Americans. And then, as I indicated earlier, you had the uh, Edge Hill projects and other parts of the community that were uh, uh, poor. So we had, in that sense, we had people who were 
complicated because one of the reasons this, this too you will find in Dr. Bobby Lovett's uh, uh, book on the history of Nashville and African Americans in Nashville, the uh, there was a lawsuit with the NAACP filed on behalf of black teachers for equal pay, and that was successful, and that led to the ability to buy houses in that area. Uh, and one thing about the Edge Hill area, uh, it would it runs all the way down to the Van University campus. And then on parts of that, and also Music Row is down over in that area as well. Growing up, we knew that there were boundaries that we could go to and we would not go to as we traveled in our own communities. And we had South Street, we had uh, all the way, we had a, a very, uh, and all the way up to Horton, those areas to the reservoir. All of those were areas that were occupied by African-Americans. The one of the things about uh, the neighborhood also was that uh, what did together was Cameron High School. Cameron uh, was originally located downtown. It was on 5th Street, 5th Avenue South rather, across from the Country Music Hall of Fame. That's, as I mentioned to you, when African-Americans uh, congregated around Fort Andrew Johnson, which was the state capital, which is because of civil war. That was our community. That was the, the largest part of the community, the African Americans for all intents and purposes. We had the colored YMCA was there. Citizen Saving Bank and Trust Company was there. Also, we had the, um, and all of that was located where you now see the, the bus station and municipal auditorium. All of that was located in that area. The Sunday School Publishing Board, which is the publishing arm of the uh, Sunday School Convention, the African American uh, uh, Sunday School Board and its publishing arm. All of that was there, all of the African Americans were there. Uh, Z. Alexander Luby's office was there, Avon Williams' office. So we were all in that area, uh, many of them. And, and so when Urban Renewal came, all of that was taken away, at least the YMCA citizen moved into the publishing board. But the citizens, all those homes that were destroyed uh, and then they, many of them migrated to the HO community. The Cameron was the, um, was a school that, uh, we went to the high school prior to that, everybody was going to Pearl, but Cameron ultimately became a high school and it was moved from the, uh, the downtown area, which interestingly enough, Cameron initially was Pearl junior high school. Pearl also was named Pearl grammar school. It started off as a grammar school. Then it became a high school when the high school Megs was shifted over to Pearl, and then ultimately Pearl went out north, was moved on uh, to 16th Street, and ultimately uh, out north and to North Nashville, and became the crown jewel of the North Nashvilleans African American community. And Cameron was ours. Cameron was located over on First Avenue, which is close to Murfreesboro Road. Uh, I, I was listening to Mr. Overton talk about having to go to school and in a segregated manner. And the same was true for us. Now we're on Edge Hill and that's roughly two miles from uh, First Avenue or Murfreesboro Road where Cameron was located. But we had to walk uh, and white kids had buses, uh, school buses. We only could get about yellow school buses. We only saw that on TV or when they passed us. And of course <laughs> they would yell things at you as they passed and I won't repeat them. Their school was located right up the street from our high school, their high school was Howard High School. It is now where you, the tax assessor's office, you get your licenses and all that sort of thing. But oh, they were yeah. right up the street, but they rode buses and we walked. It was, We walked those two miles and we often would cross through the cemetery in order to try to get there on time. Uh, the problem with that, you could not go back through there at night unless you had extreme courage if you stayed at school for various activities. But Cameron was the, uh, Cameron was the, the force that united that whole community of African Americans, and uh, of course, our arch rival was Pearl, and uh, that that was uh, and that was the North part. So Cameron had uh, the unifying force, and out of out of Edge Hill came some very instrumental people. Uh, that made, uh, national had some effect nationally, and uh, and a lot of uh, scholars among others. But it was a safe community. It was a community that was uh, that was determined to ultimately uh, gain its place in our society. 
and overcame segregation. By the way, the books that they would receive, we would receive, had uh, they were used books, and we could use furniture. I'll never understand it, but it's so it what well I do understand in the context of how people think. But when the high schools of Overton and uh, Hillsborough and the other uh, white high schools, when they would finish, when they when new textbooks were ordered, the other ones apparently been out of date. They would shift to Cameron when the furniture was used and they bought new furniture. The school board would shift those to Cameron. Speak for Pearl, but I, I suspect they received the same sort of thing. Uh, and they would be marked up and we knew what time of day it was, but it didn't stop us. Uh, we were determined. Uh, we were determined to achieve. As a matter of fact, the instructors, the teachers, uh, demanded that that would be your goal. And so with that kind of community, we were determined and it was one way to go and that was up and uh, continue. Uh, seek uh, freedom for all the citizens in Nashville and elsewhere. Thank you so much for that. I want to follow up with something that he was charging. Uh, most people don't know about this. Most whites don't know about this. But schools like Cameron, Pearl, Black Pearl High, uh, like uh, Chattanooga Howard, Okay, mm -hmm. Oxford, Austin, okay, uh, Washington, I think it was a bull of Washington out of Memphis. Uh, mm -hmm. There was another big black school in Memphis, and there was a Catholic school in Memphis, I think it was named Father Birch. Now, where mm -hmm. this is, we were perhaps playing football in a black football league in high school and basketball. That's because of segregation, okay? We couldn't go to the other schools. But I often like to tell this little story because we 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 had some professional athletes I take in high school, okay, and they they made a big contribution to the social life of our community. You would go to the big football stadium on Friday night uh, at a black high school, and it may be three thousand folk out there. That seemed a lot of folk back at this point in time, back in the fifties and the sixties. That's a lot of folk. Uh, at a high school football game. We were playing this kind of football all over the South, okay? And we went to college. We were playing at a level of football that was higher than some of the other schools had because they didn't have this, this, this regional kind of approach to it. We really had a regional approach. But as he was talking, I started to just let my mind wander a little bit and say, oh, segregation probably equipped us and, and armed us a certain kind of way to be high achievers. Uh, no matter what the field of human endeavor might be, segregation probably driving us to mm. higher level of achievement in our latter life. But that's because of what we experienced. Uh, we experienced this, you know, you couldn't go to the lunch counters, okay? Uh, you couldn't, you know, you had to go to the black restroom. You had to go to the black water fountain. See, all of these things, you know, was just how ingrained that segregated system was, okay? And I, I just think it's a, it's a miracle, really, that we were able to in, endure that level of segregation and discrimination, come out of it being the people that we are today. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I think that there's a quote that escaped, the person whose quote it is escapes me, but the quote says that neglect breeds resilience. And I think that's very true for the state of black Americans concerning uh, segregation at that time. You have to, you have no choice but to be self-sufficient when you have no other option to suffice you. You have to rely on yourself. And in that regard, black people definitely carved out their own piece of success and, and baked their own American pie in that regard. So I, I definitely agree with you there. Now, there's something that's definitely been common among all of your experiences throughout Tennessee, and that one thing is, of course, segregation in that time period. And since we know that segregation is definitely a challenge, this leads us right on into our next question. What obviously are some of the main challenges historically facing the community? Of course, we know segregation, but segregation is one problem 
that's a uh, kind of the result of many other underlying problems. So what are some of the challenges facing the community historically? And then what are some of the challenges facing the community today? And again, I'm gonna start with uh, Mr. Griffin. Let me, let me say this, as I was listening to Mr. Smith and Mr. Overton speak, um, it seems that I've heard these stories before from my own parents, from my grandparents, um, I've lived in many places and I've heard many stories. I grew up in East Orange, New Jersey, which is right next to Newark. So growing up in New Jersey was a completely different experience. I started kindergarten in 1960 when, when the segregation in the North had already happened and it hadn't already happened down here, but it had happened in the North already. So I had a different experience, but listening to my grandparents and my aunties and uncles talk about having come from the South and the things that they went through, uh, listening to Mr. Overton and Mr. Smith, it's almost as if it's the same story, of <laughs> the same story from a different location. Yeah. Uh, my mother was born and raised in Oxford, Mississippi, and, and Mr. Smith was talking ab about Nashville, and it seems like he was in, in Oxford with my mother. It's the same story about the used books and walking to school and having to jump in a ditch because the white kids were on buses and, 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 and calling yeah. their names. And it's just interesting to me how this story has played out all over this country. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just interesting to me how that happened. As far as the challenges that we had and that we do have, my personal feeling is that education has always been a challenge. Yeah. We couldn't go. My parents never went to college not because they didn't want to go to college. Firstly, they couldn't afford it. And secondly, there weren't too many places where they could go. And that was a challenge. So those who did make it were, were special and sometimes considered privileged because they were able to go. And again, that's why my parents insisted that I go to college. Richard didn't want to go to college. Richard wanted to go to work. But my parents said, no, they, they basically lived their lives through me. Uh, so I had to go to college and went off to Tuskegee Institute. Also, jobs. And when you live in a rural area, here's, here's the dilemma. You live in the rural area, you go off to college and you become an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, but there are no jobs in your rural area. You have to leave your home that you love so much. You have to leave and go elsewhere to do what you do. I mean, how many lawyers could make it here in, in rural Tennessee in Henning. You know, we, we don't need 15, mm -hmm. one or two, one or two. Uh, and there were plumbers, you, you named the profession. Mostly you had to go elsewhere to achieve that. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people who grew up here, who went off to college and came back to give back. And I think that that's, that's significant. But I would say the challenges have been and continue to be getting a great education. Now we know that the governor, the former governor started the, uh, what is the hope scholarship and the promise scholar because there just were not enough people in the state of Tennessee. And I believe it was less than 30% that had a secondary degree of any type. And when he was trying to bring new businesses and, and, and factories into the state, he couldn't do it because they weren't ready to operate the machines or handle the mathematical kinds of things that they had to handle in these new factories. So they were going to other states. That's why he put that program in place where you can get free education and get going so that the state of Tennessee could compete with other states. So education has always been an issue and continues to be an issue. Now the pandemic, the pandemic has just made things difficult. Not that we can't get through it, and, and uh, as an educator, I will say this: we will get through it. You know, this a little rough sledding at this point, but we will get through it. Here in here in, in, in West Tennessee, the other problem that small towns that Henning, like Henning, have had is when your biggest employer leaves, yeah. it's over. It's pretty much over. So what do the people do? They don't leave town necessarily, but they go outside town in order to find employment. Uh, and I can say this for the, the folk that I know in Henning who have left and have come back and have stayed, uh, 
They are employed in other places because at this point, there's not too much industry. Uh, there's only one factory here in the town of Henny, um, and there are other employers, but uh, they found employment elsewhere, local hospitals. We have, a, we have a state prison nearby, 20 miles away. So there's a lot of employment there, school districts and things of that nature. So looking forward, we need to find ways to continue to educate the young people. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that we make, we need to make sure we do, as Mr. Overton was speaking and Mr. Smith was speaking, we need to make sure they don't forget where we came from, what we went through, how we made it over. This is significant and important. And later on, I'll talk a little bit about how we uh, try to achieve that through genealogy here at the Alex Haley Museum. Okay, okay. I'm very interested to hear that. And I, I totally agree with you that not completely understanding how we got to where we are plays a role in some of the attitudes that you see towards the community today. Um, not understanding who built the community and the ways in which they built the community and the things they went through to grow the community after they built it. Um, I definitely think a lack of knowledge in that it kind of goes into the attitude that especially people in my generation have towards the community and not really feeling the same sense of pride in the community. Um, so that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, now, Mr. Overton, could you give me a little bit about uh, some of the challenges facing Chattanooga historically and today? I can uh, agree wholeheartedly with what Griffin was saying. That is, education is going to always be our primary and our heaviest focal point. Because without the education, and I'm not talking about college, I'm not talking about PhDs and all of that. I'm talking about education of the general population. Okay, getting to a proficiency level in education where they can operate, you know, the mathematics that is needed that they can operate certain types of machinery that is needed. Keep in mind, I, I think I hit, Chattanooga is kind of like an industrial town. We make things here, okay? We make things here. And as a result of that, there are factories all over this city, all over this, this county, all around us in other counties. And the problem is, for the, for the, for the, for the population, is getting the job scheme, okay? Next challenge is getting the labor unions, okay, uh, to step up and take a better position upon equity of training. Uh, I think that I think that uh, I think that training at the technical level, uh, beyond high school, two-year level, apprenticeship program, all of these things need to be somehow addressed and improved and enhanced in order to produce more equity in our society in terms of people being able to take care. Of take care of themselves. I think another challenge is the politics, okay? I think politically, uh, we have to stay on top of politics. We have to stay on top of voting. I think just came through, we just came through an election process where we saw the relevance of getting our people out to vote, okay? Voting is very important in this democracy that we live in. If you stay home, you'll get just what you deserve, okay? So yeah. we need to, Bolster our efforts on political side and make sure that we're getting our young people out registered voting and getting our young adults, getting our senior citizens to continue to increase their vote power in the society that that we live in, that we live in. I think that we talked about. Uh, I think there's a spiritual side of this as well. Okay, uh, and I think the spiritual side of it says that. We have to become a lot more aware of our personal worth, how we get to a better understanding of our personal worth in terms of the society in which we feel. Okay. Uh, we need to understand that, that we are important. We need to understand that we that we can do anything that anybody else can do and even do it at higher levels than a lot of folks can do it. Okay. We come from a rich civilization called Africa. Okay. In that civilization, we were headed for certain skills and talents that if we're not careful, uh, these things will fall by, by the wayside and go forward. So I think there's a spiritual side to, to the whole thing. I think the greatest challenge, I think the greatest challenge uh, for us going forward really is in the area of jobs. Take care of yourself. Uh, and you can't, if you don't have money in this society, 
uh, you always find you're going to be on the short end of a stick. Okay, so jobs, training to get those jobs, the type of training that is needed to occupy those jobs. Everybody, I, I can't stress this enough, but I was, I was an executive in a hospital. I know how many jobs are in a hospital that are filled by non-college educated people. But they come out of trade schools. They come out of two-year colleges, okay? Jobs in the Lord, okay? And I think that's what we've got to figure out is how do we chat with people maybe a little bit different to get them to that first job, then they can work on the second and third job a little bit later as they go. But I think jobs is, is, is a key uh, to it. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic about where to from here. I really believe that, that, that if we stay on the job and if we continue to push for our civil rights, uh, I think we end up being okay. But if we aren't careful, we may slide backwards and go back to the 50s and the 60s. And that will spell doom okay, for our race. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I, I specifically agree with you on the point you made about the spiritual connection. Uh, I'm a preacher's kid, so I definitely understand the importance of knowing exactly just how how worthy we as Black people are to uh, worthy of accomplishments and worthy of um, attaining and achieving all of the things that we desire. I think that there's definitely a very special place to put the spiritual component in this conversation. But I also agree with you on the economic standpoint. Until we have some economic enfranchisement, Black people as a culture will forever be behind in one way or another because, again, uh, this is America and America runs on capitalism. So until we get some capital, we won't have a dog in the fight. So you definitely hit the nail on the head there. Now, Mr. Smith, mm -hmm. could you give me a little bit about some of the challenges historically facing the Edge Hill community and what are some of the challenges that you face that you see now? I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to have something unique to say here as an attorney. I'm very interested. Well. One of the things that is, and this is a nationwide scenario, it is gentrification. That in this, that uh, the real issue that we must un confront and to, uh, is just simply this: Will those communities like Edge Hill and through other parts of the nation, will they still be able to produce people who will make contributions to the advance uh, not only of our nation but uh, as a people? For instance, in that Edge Hill community, uh, William Edmondson, who was a railroad worker and a janitor, he lived in Edge Hill, but he was the first African-American artist to have a solo exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He was a self-taught sculptor. Uh, his works reflected religion and spirituality and, and history. We also had Reverend Bill Barnes. Bill Barnes was a white citizen who moved in the com community and, and really fought for the community and was one who uh, had, uh, I don't know whether it was the first, it's the first I ever saw growing up. He was, had the first integrated church, Edge Hill United, Me United Methodist Church. We had such people as uh, Ed and Wayne Sadler. I was in school with them. Ed and Wayne lived in the projects. They both got scholarships to Harvard. The uh, W.O. Smith was a musician, played the Nashville Symphony. The school, the music school located on Edge Hill Avenue. Uh, is named after him. We had uh, such people as uh, D4 Bailey. He lived in the Edge Hill community. Okay. He lived in I.W. Gurnett. He was the uh, uh, first uh, black citizen to perform, the, who was performing at the Grand Ole Opry and became a star with his harmonica and the train sound and, and was admitted into the uh, uh, Hall of Fame, Grand Ole Opry Hall of Fame. He had a shoe sign shop uh, in Edge Hill. Uh, we've had a lot of great people, and one of them was Z Zima Hill, who was a minister and a funeral home director. He bought those polar bears that is symbolic of the Edge Hill community. They are two big white polar bears with snowballs in their hands. He had in front of his house. He also had some in front of uh, his uh, funeral home. And those bears used to scare me to death every time <laughs> I would pass it as a young child. Uh, but and they had some Italian origin that they were made and then bought by a ice cream company for on display, et cetera. But the question is, will we have the type and the type of support that will continue to produce people? Uh, with the gentrification, uh, it is affecting the poor predominantly in, in, that, in the sense that the houses are being bought 
for uh, relatively, even if it's, it does cost to some degree, uh, the price can't be resisted to being up. And since many of some don't own those homes, they're renting. Those neighborhoods are changing dramatically. Uh, it's not only, it's not peculiar to Nashville, it is a nationwide scenario. Mm -hmm. How do you address that? And for instance, the projects, the edge hill projects, they call them edge hill apartments now. It's the same place we live, but it was called projects. Uh, they have a new plan. It's called Envision Edge Hill. And it's going to be, right now, there's 380 subsidized units existing in edge hill projects. But the new plan calls for a mixed use, mixed income, and it'll have about 1,400 1, units to 1,500 apartments, and it would be mixed use to mixed income, though the plan is suggesting that it will maintain at least 380 units of subsidized housing. The character of the community, I think one must continue to monitor that. For instance, when urban renewal came in the community, they destroyed over 400 homes, uh, many of them African Americans in and around that state capital. And where do they go? Where did they go? I went to Edge over where you go. Uh, what happens to when, for instance, even in the most recent, in, in the urban renewal in the 60s, uh, a lot of the homes were destroyed in, in South Nashville, in the Edge Hill community, and the property was sold to commercial entities. Uh, so, our in this, we're going to build something better and do something better. That's not been good. And the question is, will we monitor? Will there be some sense that this new change will, I know that they did a feasibility study utilizing residents and having their contribution. But let me just say this. When the urban renewal destroyed many homes and, and a lot of other things that took place, a lot of the upwardly mobile African-Americans moved away from the community. And that left the poor to defend uh, the community and, and, and to defend and keep up traditions and try to uh, remain a, a vibrant community. Mm -hmm. And as there will be change, will this continue to be the same outcome? We, we don't know. We'll just have to see, but we would hope the city has passed to the point that it, it will take in consideration us as a people and not as uh, a group that, uh, you know, we can put to the side and do anything we want with, but we'll be working in the best interest of this community as Nashvillians and not just another group of people uh, or a different people. Uh, so we have many challenges ahead. Uh, I'm confident that we can do this, but it's going to take just not the African American uh, yeah. alone. And that's that's where we need our brothers and sisters who are not African American. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we need your support and your, your input and your fairness. I think if we get that, I think many problems could be solved. Uh, but one thing that people don't understand, and they think, well, the, the Negroes aren't advancing because it's their fault. You got to understand the same forces that defeated Nazi Germany, the power of the United States, with the same forces aligned against African Americans, yeah. state governments federal government. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, well, look at the immigrants that over and they're doing well. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't have the government on them. They could mm -hmm. also become just an American by the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. You can be here two months and you can be an American. Yes. Your skin identifies us. And then you see nothing beyond that. You need to see the contributions, the world culture, of America that America has displayed to the world, most a lot of that is African American culture. Mm -hmm. We paid our price. My father was in World War II, and I think my uncle was in World War I. <laughs> we run our race and we've kept the faith. And so this is our country too. And I don't like the political structure that America is going through. All of that is related to every issue that we have encountered and will encounter. And so we need your help, ladies and gentlemen. If you're a white citizen, then let us work for fairness. Let us work for uh, understanding that all people have value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we're going to solve most of the problems that we might encounter.
I wholeheartedly agree with you as well. Uh, when I was doing my research on the Edge Hill community uh, prior to this conversation, uh, one of the biggest things that kept popping up on the in the research is is gentrification and the, the prevalence of it in the Edge Hill community today. And of course, we're seeing this in black communities throughout America right now. This isn't just a Nashville or Edge Hill or Jefferson Street problem. It's a national problem. Um, so I definitely think and agree with you that the way that we handle gentrification is going to be very telling about how we move forward in, in race relations today, to be completely honest. Now, I want to get a little bit more specific with you here, and I'm going to, of course, start with you, Mr. Griffin. Now, a 2012 article written uh, by the local NPR station, WKNO, uh, they talked about the decline of Henning and other similar rural towns due to the flight of people, the lack of investment, um, and it also mentioned the local government's wish to make Henning a tourist town. Now, had any of these developments began to take place before the pandemic? Is there still talk of these developments? Are we still trying to build up Henning? What's going on there today? Before I worked here at the Alex Haley Museum, I worked for the town of Henning. I learned a lot during the time that I was there at the town of Henning. <clears throat> there have been several efforts, uh, mostly in the late 80s and in the early 90s, to bring tourism back to West Tennessee. Uh, Memphis Area Association of Governments has a program called uh, Day Tripping, where people would come into Memphis and they would kind of get them over this way. Um, of course, we have Fort Pillar here. We have a Veterans Museum in Halls, Tennessee. We have the Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, where the Tina Turner Museum is. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have this gem here right here in Henning, Tennessee, the Alex Haley Museum and Interpretive Center. Uh, I, I think that there was an effort to try to coordinate trips out here. Our dilemma right now is that we're not on Main Street. We're not downtown Nashville or Chattanooga. We're not in Memphis. We're in a rural area and when people come to Jackson, Tennessee, when people come to Memphis, when people come to South Haven, Mississippi, or West Memphis, uh, Arkansas, or um, Kentucky, and they're within an hour of us, they want to come, but they have no means to come. Mm -hmm. And my dream has been to, before I leave here, to see if we can put together a coalition of organizations that can work to bring people here and I like that idea of the jitney. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey and in Atlantic City, they had jitneys and they came every 10 minutes. You didn't have to wait long for a jitney to come along. And uh, you could get, oh, what, five, six, eight people in a jitney? You need to find a way to do that. So our, the dilemma for us uh, here is uh, getting people here. There's the desire, the desire is great. And uh, uh, there was some study done uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And they wanted to, um, right before they built this particular interpretive center, the house was already here, had become a museum in 1986. The town and the state of Tennessee were had gone together and they were thinking about creating an amphitheater here where they could bring cultural events and music back to Henning to revitalize Henning because Henning needed something. Uh, I'm not sure why it didn't materialize. I think it might have been funding. Uh, that always seems to be an issue. <laughs> uh, but the desire to have it is still here. Now, a lot of times people will come to the museum and when they come in, you'll greet them. And the first thing they will say is, what happened to your town? Well, I wasn't here. I've only been in the area for 12 years, but I already uh, forecast what what I thought, according to what people tell me, what happened. And so we, the, the, the desire is here to get to get back what we had, but it, it's going to cost money. Uh, the town, I understand, is looking for some grants to do some uh, streetscape kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, when people come into town and it doesn't, it's not inviting, it's, it's an issue. So once we get the streetscaping taken care of and we, we think of, of ways of bringing um, people back. I think we can do that. Now, here's the thing. 
Uh, we, we, we have Ripley, Tennessee, right next door. Mm -hmm. Great tomato festival, state known tomato festival every year. And they have mm -hmm. the Relay for Life. And then they have the county fair. So everything is over there. Now, Henning and Gates, because we're so small, 700 people in, in Gates, uh, 1,000 people in Henning, uh, 8,900 8, people in, in Ripley. You know, we kind of take a second seat and end up participating with them over there. Mm -hmm. But we need to find a way, we need to find a, a way to bring things uh, back here. And I think we can do that, in, you know, the town and the, and the uh, museum together can coordinate some events uh, that will bring people and bring events and bring the culture and um, the economic growth back to the town of Kenya. Okay. No, I, th I think that's it. I think that's interesting. I've heard of the tomato festival as well. I know I went to college with some people from the region who have talked about <laughs> the tomato festival before. And I, I know that it's a big part of the community and as a very community centric person, as a, as a community organizer, um, I think that it's very important to bring something back to Henning so that Henning can be represented in the way that it should be. Um, represented for the history that it holds and making sure that that history does not die. So if there's anything that I or the museum can do to assist in those endeavors, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Let me say this also, that the churches here do a great job, a great job trying to trying to memorialize the history of, of this town. And they, they just do a great job. And I, I, and I do wanna say also that many, many people that I've met here since I've been here who left? They did come back. They came back, and and and, and they're trying. They're, they're running for office. Um, they're they're taking uh, an interest in what happens here. So mm -hmm. change is coming. Mm -hmm. okay? Change is coming to hand. Um, it's a little slow right now, but change is coming to the town of Kenya. And you, you're beginning to see this in a lot of rural areas that people are coming back. I know I'm a millennial. I was born in 1991. And I know some of the people that I went to college with are beginning to move back to their rural areas. And like you said, they're running for office now. They're running for city council and they're doing all that they can with the knowledge that they've attained in a big city and bringing some of that knowledge back to their small towns and trying to implement some new structures. And I think it's amazing. I think that rural communities absolutely should not die because there's so much culture and history in those rural communities. Those are our actual roots. And um, I would love to see Henning continue to thrive. Now, for Mr. Overton, Chattanooga, I, outside of Bessie Smith, I will not lie, I was not very aware of all of the music history that Chattanooga offered. Uh, like, you, like I told you earlier, I'm a Memphian. When I think music history, my mind immediately goes to West Tennessee. And then if you think about country music, obviously Middle Tennessee. So I was especially interested to see all of the jazz musicians that had come out of Chattanooga, some of them being, uh, of course, Bessie Smith. I found the impressions, uh, the Lady of Snow, Jimmy Blanton. There was a long list of people in the music industry in Chattanooga. Could you tell me a little bit about how that happened and uh, what's going on with the music industry there now? Well, there's not much going on with the music industry here now. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a essay. Okay, uh, I think that the, uh, like you said, is that the city as it developed in the 30s, late 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, and the 50s, okay, when people didn't have other places and things to go and do, okay, mm -hmm. again, these musicians that came out of here, okay, they were parts of bands, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware, just to be honest with you, I, I, I can give you a couple names, but you know, I, there's not a great list that I know of. Okay, uh, music, uh, music is, is something that associated with Bessie Smith. Okay, pretty much. Okay, uh, Blanton. Uh, there's a couple of drummers that I knew that played with James Brown. Okay, uh, but music itself. Uh, you know, we had some great people who played. Uh, you know, church organs. You know, and stuff like that. I'm not aware of this plethora, okay, of musicians that came out of Chattanooga, okay, mm -hmm. and made it to the bigger stage, in any mm -hmm. shape, form, or fashion. Uh, they mostly were parts of other bands and other groups, okay. okay. And so Chattanooga was kind of like a small venue, okay, okay. for music.
But see, we were always challenged by Atlanta, okay? Yeah. And maybe Birmingham, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we held our own, you know, against all of that. You have to keep in mind is that Chattanooga, basically, I tell you, was an industrial town, okay? Mm -hmm. Had a lot of nightclubs and entertainment spots, okay, that these bands would be coming through and play. I can remember as a as a as a teenager and as a young adult, you know, just going to different nightclubs and hearing different bands coming through, but they was on their way the next morning somewhere else, or maybe that same night. Okay. Uh, so I'm not a great not a, I'm not a real great on that music tradition. Okay. Uh, but what I think I, I think as, as I see it, Chattanooga, I want to pull something that he that you're talking about in terms of, you know, the Chattanooga is kind of, uh, we've been through that, we've been through that thing about bringing back tourism. We've been through that. We've mm -hmm. got that done. Okay? We've got museums, we've got uh, aquariums, we've got all of these things in place, all located in the downtown Chattanooga area. Bessie Smith Cultural Center. Okay. We've got that. Okay. Uh, we, they started out to develop a, a regional African American uh, museum, but it was going to be part of an exhibit in another museum. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so the Bessie Smith Cultural Center has kind of taken on the preservation of African American uh, history in Chattanooga, and it mm -hmm. features primarily Bessie Smith as being the most of all of them. Okay, uh, so I think that we've been through that. You know, we've uh, we're now we're now in this industrial retooling. Okay, we brought the people back, come through and spend some money, uh, in the in the restaurants and the hotels and places like that. But what we needed was some jobs. Okay, so now we're in the process of trying to expand our industrial capability. Uh, Volkswagen plant is located here, right here in Chattanooga. Uh, they probably employed. 3,500, 4,000 people. Okay, that's been our most, not our most recent adventure. But we have seen, been focused more on job development and, and industry development because we pretty much have got the tourist thing done. Okay, uh, so we've kind of moved on from that. Okay, um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any great music. Uh, uh, ventures that's going on here in Chattanooga. Other sure. people sure. that come through and entertain in a concert. Okay. 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 Yeah, no, I, there's a, a rap artist there, Isaiah Rashad. He's actually doing a, a lot of good work representing Chattanooga right now in a mount from a modern lens. Um, and then I also know that Chattanooga was also big on the, the Chitlin circuit uh, in the, the 40s and the 50s as well. Uh, so I, I definitely read a little bit about that. So I think it being an industrial town, having people constantly coming and going through the area kept uh, maybe the nightlife scene continuously thriving, which uh, definitely probably helped it over time. Yeah. Now, last but not least, uh, this may be our last question due to time, but Mr. Smith, mm -hmm. according to an article written by your colleague, my former professor, Dr. Joel Dark, uh, the name Edge Hill came about during the era of urban renewal, even though the community existed way before this change. Now, given the pivotal role that urban renewal had on the community of Edge Hill, how is that moment remembered by longtime members of the community? Do they remember it? And if they do, how are they still grappling with the memory of urban renewal, especially going through gentrification? Yes. Well, they, they remember urban, we all do remember urban renewal. It was a promise for a better life. Now, I will say this, and this is one of the one thing. Now, many of the houses that were in the community uh, when urban renewal came in, we're talking about the 60s uh, or 50s and 60s, roughly in those areas. Their, the houses, many of them were rented and they had absentee landlords. And then in some instances, then, for instance, uh, the predominant source of heat, uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about the projects, I'm talking about the, many of the houses. And it varied because you got to remember in the we had, uh, uh, we had the well-to-do and we had the not-so-well-to-do. And in many of the houses uh, that were in the not-too-well-to-do, it was heated by uh, coal and uh, just the stove and 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 that sort of thing and uh and 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 so perhaps that i know 
many people who did get the benefit to move into the projects, it was a step up. It was a glorious moment. One was greeted with electric heat or gas heat. I can't remember which one it was at this point in time, but it was not the coal or the wood that traditionally in, in the neighborhood, which I lived on Horton and we lived on Horton initially, which was right up the street from Jill projects and, and, and that entire community. And it, it varied too, uh, in terms of, uh, homes and the rest. So it brought a sense of promise, but for those homes that were destroyed, those who actually owned their homes, it was not good for, they did not like that to have happened. One thing, uh, one thing about when urban renewal did come through, also there was civil rights advancements about segregated housing. Mm -hmm. And so with that uh, being uh, declared constitutionally illegal, you also had a lot of people moving out to areas that heretofore was forbidden. And ultimately we became part of that, that movement out beyond, still in South Nashville, uh, still close to the edge of community, but yet, uh, there were more there were houses and 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 and, and flight and all of that which took place in, a, in in during that time period. But I think they may be looking forward to the Envision Nashville, the new proposal. Uh, it does seem to be bringing something that the area would would not have had, uh, in that it is bringing uh, businesses uh, supposed to be part of its use, uh, and hopefully that would benefit benefit it. Uh, the IW Granite Home, which is a home for the elderly and those apartment are, as I understand it, to remain in place. And that had provided a, uh, when you, when, for the elderly, that had provided a sense of comfort. Uh, even went up when it was there. I had an aunt that lived there and it, she was very happy to have been in that unit. And so, and I was, I was young. So I used to go to store for her because she couldn't do it. But in any event, there's always hope. And I think the Envision National, if it if it accomplishes what it's suggesting, it, it will be a good thing. But we always have to wait and see. But there's always hope. I love that. I love to see that all of these communities are still thriving in one way or another today. And I'm most interested to see how all of them continue to thrive throughout time, especially our more rural communities, um, because we definitely know that they're a little bit more disconnected from everyday society. So we got to figure out a way to make sure those communities stay intact and make sure that the history stays intact as well. Um, but with that being said, I don't want to hold y'all all night long because I know we all have stuff to do. It's Friday Eve. Um, so I'm going to turn it over back into the hands of Joyska uh, because there is a survey that we want you guys to try to complete, those of you who are in attendance. Uh, but I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that before we call this a night. But thank you to our panelists. Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Bridget. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Robert, Richard, Irvin. Uh, hearing you was amazing. I loved all of your stories. Uh, if you're still on and you want to share your thoughts with us on this program, and if you have thoughts for any future programs, I put the link of, of our survey on the in the chat bar. So you know, just click on that and let us know. But we hope you have a great evening and um, thank you for joining us for our last Black History Month program. All right, y'all. Have a good one.